From Deloitte Tax and Legal Japan, welcome to The Japan Perspective. This is a podcast where we speak to specialists from across Deloitte to discuss the latest business issues impacting foreign multinational companies in Japan. I'm your host, Joanna Hazel. Today's episode is about the newly enacted Qualified Invoice System, or QIS, and the impact it has had on businesses operating here in Japan. Today's guest is Nicole Baxter. Nicole is a senior manager and a member of the Indirect Tax Team. Nicole, I understand that as an indirect tax professional, you have firsthand experience in assisting clients in navigating this new qualified invoice system, as it's mainly concerned with reporting Japanese consumption tax amounts. Now, before we dive into our discussion, can you just give our listeners a brief high-level introduction of this new qualified invoice system? Thanks, Joanna, and thanks for having me on the podcast today, and hello to all those listening. Um, Yes, so how about we start with a very just brief high-level overview of what the qualified invoice system is, just in case some listeners are not familiar with these new rules. Um, If we look at it from the perspective of a buyer and supplier, that's probably the easiest way to look at the impact that it has on your business. So firstly, as a buyer making taxable purchases, if you are not in possession of a valid qualified invoice to substantiate an input JPT deduction on a taxable purchase, then under the new rules, you as a taxpayer cannot take that deduction. Now, not only does this lead to potential additional cash tax costs, but if you as the JCT taxpayer are subject to future tax audits and there are deductions taken and you don't have that qualified invoice and or your accounting book entries don't support the claim, then you as a taxpayer may be subject to penalties and interest on any overclaimed input JCT. Now, as a supplier, Commercially, it may impact the relationship you have with your business customers if you cannot issue a qualified invoice as your products or your supply of goods and services become more expensive if your customer cannot take that input tax deduction. Now, in terms of assisting clients and where they are on the scale of being ready, it really depends on the individual client. For example, some clients we've been assisting for nearly 12 months in their transition to the new system. And given that we have been assisting them for so long, they're in good positions now, they're registered, they can issue compliant qualified invoices in their ERP systems, and they can also determine as a buyer qualified and compliant invoices. Whereas other clients, we're seeing, for example, those in the digital services space, they've really used this qualified invoice system implementation as a point to review their supply chains and just see what impact, if any, or what new obligations they may have under these new rules. So it sounds like clients are kind of across the board when it comes to to readiness for this new QIS. Uh, As I understand it, this new qualified invoice system has been live for two months now, I believe. So in practice, what have you been seeing um, from clients in terms of how they're actually operating under this new live system? Yeah, well, I guess given, you know, that our intended audience are those clients in the inbound space, I guess of you know, particular relevance to inbound clients are maybe issues around the invoices itself. So if you are used to operating or practicing in traditional GST or VAT jurisdictions, some of these nuances under the Japan rules may be a little bit foreign or unfamiliar. So for example, um, one of the requirements for a compliant qualified invoice is that the invoice must be rounded on an invoice level and not on a line by line basis. So we have heard from some clients that, you know, there are internal limitations within their ERP system, which don't allow for this type of rounding. So what that means is that clients have to do adjustments in order to ensure that they are reporting and remitting the correct amount of JCT. 
Now, also peculiar to Japan is for invoices issued in a foreign currency, there are four prescribed methods which clients have to choose from choose one and then they have to apply those methods when they're converting JCT amounts that are listed on an invoice in a foreign currency when they're converting that to Japanese yen. So that's, I guess, another um, nuance that maybe inbound clients weren't really aware of, but they're working through that now. And then also, I guess, one other point that inbound clients may not be too familiar with is that a qualified invoice does not necessarily need to meet all the requirements in one document, but the requirements can be satisfied across a number of documents if the relationship between those documents is clear. So, for example, if you say the JCT amount is stated on a delivery note, for example, on the transaction unit level, and then the invoice is monthly unit and that's issued subsequently, then in such cases, the rounding can be done once for each delivery note. So I guess that's another you know, particular area of interest that some clients may not have been familiar with. That's so interesting. I didn't know that. I just learned that you can use multiple documents collectively to, to satisfy the QI requirements. Thanks for that, Nicole. I want to switch gears now just a little bit. Uh, I understand that the indirect tax landscape in Japan is going through some other changes as well, in addition to the qualified invoice system. As I understand it, there have also been developments uh, on platform taxation. Are you able to provide any insight into those new rules as well? Sure, Joanna. And for some of our listeners, they may remember that in the 2023 budget, the government announced its intention to introduce marketplace rules for digital services. Now, at the time of that announcement, the scope of the obligations that would be imposed on marketplaces or platforms were unclear and no implementation date was provided. But if we fast forward nearly 12 months, the Ministry of Finance has just very recently concluded and released its study group and their preliminary findings, which actually offer more insight on these proposed rules. So what we know from this report is that the rules will mainly impact foreign suppliers, which sell B2C or business to consumer digital services on platforms. Now it will be the platform operators who will be required to collect the consumption tax on the supply of digital services to Japanese customers. Now this is because generally they are in a better position to collect and remit the JCT on digital services compared with the underlying foreign supplier. Okay, so question, when you were reading through that study group report, did you find any key features that may impact our listeners in that marketplace? Yeah, so what we do know, Joanna, and these may be, you know, subject to change as the law gets drafted, but what we do know now is that the platform operator will be deemed to be the seller of the digital services and not the principal foreign supplier. Uh, no sales threshold will be imposed on the seller, therefore the platform operator will be required to collect JCT on all sales, regardless of the seller's JCT taxpayer status. Uh, as I mentioned before, the new rules will only apply to B2C transactions. The definition or term platform operator is yet to be defined, but one option currently being considered is a threshold test, specifically that if the platform operator exceeds a prescribed sales threshold, it may be treated as a platform operator for the purpose of these rules. Um, the sales threshold refers to the total sum of the taxable sales of the principal foreign supplier. The names of qualifying platform operators will be made publicly available, and this is to ensure transparency between parties in the supply chain. And then finally, we understand that the specified period test, which is used for determining whether a business is a JCT taxpayer, under which domestic salary payments can currently substitute the taxable sales amount, this test will be amended and the substitution will no longer apply to foreign taxpayers. 
Hmm. Do you have any indication of an implementation implementation date for these amendments? Unfortunately, no, no date was provided, mm -hmm. but the Ministry of Finance did indicate that it would implement the rules as early as possible. And what we take this to mean is that they'll start to draft the law in the new year in time for Parliament, which will sit from January to June next year. Okay, so this is going to be implemented quite soon. It's our, our listeners should be getting ready for changes sooner rather than later. Is that right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I want to switch gears one last time uh, and move a little bit away from marketplace now. Can you provide us a brief update on the changes to eligibility around claiming import JCT? Yeah, so this is relevant to the extent that the taxpayer imports goods into Japan. So there was the clarification to the determination of importer when there is no underlying import transaction, the importer is deemed to be the person with the power to dispose of the goods at the time of import and the person carrying on the activities for which the import occurred. Now, it's important to note that this clarification came into effect on June 30 this year, but it can also be applied retrospectively to all open fiscal years. So if you think this clarification may be relevant to your supply chain, it's important that you assess historical years as well. Huh. Okay, I see. I wonder, it, do you have a quick, maybe practical example of the impact it might have on supply chain, just to give a little more clarity around this? Yeah, sure. So for an example, um, you may have a Singapore regional headquarter that's bringing goods into Japan for its local Japanese subsidiary to onward sell to a third party customer. So at the time the goods are imported, there's no sale between the Singapore and Japanese entity. So historically under this supply chain, the Japanese entity may have been listed as the importer of record on the import documents and claimed the import JCT deductions. However, under the clarification, because there is no underlying import transaction at the time of import, the importer is deemed to be the person who has the right to dispose of the imported goods and use them for their intended purpose. So in this case, at the time of import, it's the Singapore entity that has the right to dispose of the goods. Therefore, it should be the one identified as the importer of record on the import documents and only it can make an import JCT deduction. Oh, okay. Thank you. That was helpful for me and hopefully it was helpful for our listeners as well. Uh, that's unfortunately all the time we have for, for today's episode. So thank you very much, Nicole, for joining and for giving us all that insight. I'm Hopefully it was very helpful and our listeners learned something today. I know for sure that I did. Uh, and thank you again to our listeners for tuning in to the Japan Perspective. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out to either Nicole or I on LinkedIn. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Joanna.